So one thing I've found, whether you're a huge company or a small company, there are two things you can do to give yourself an advantage. It don't cost a lot, just cost some brain power and some time. And that's your creativity and your agility. Uh, this was a quote from Maurice Saatchi, who founded the agency Saatchi & Saatchi. Uh, quite a while ago, creativity is the last legal way to gain an unfair advantage over your competition. I, I stole that for the name of my, my talk here, but he was talking about advertising and marketing back then. It's even more uh, relevant today if you're working in digital, if you're working in social media, because we all have the same tools. We all have the same rules. We all have the same things we can use. Sure, there's new things that come out all the time new channels that come up, things you need to learn, but in reality, we all kind of have the same thing. So how you, how you are creative and make your messaging stand out is how you can create an advantage. That's important because the average consumer sees 4,000 marketing messages a day. I've been talking about creativity and agility for about five years now. When I first started talking about it, it the number was just under 500 messages a day. Uh, when I was updating it for this presentation, uh, I found several things that said 4,000. I found one that said 5,000. 4,000, 5,000 doesn't make a difference. People are seeing a lot of messaging. And this doesn't even count the texts they get, their Facebooks, the, the Twitter from their friends, all that. So there's a lot of messages coming in. And on top of all that, People are doing whatever they can to avoid your messaging. You know, I'm, I make my living from marketing. All the money that comes into my household is from marketing, and I avoid it. I DVR everything and skip the commercials. I watch Netflix. When I'm in the car, I listen to Sirius Radio. When I'm in the office, I listen to Spotify. When I'm out in the backyard, I listen to Pandora. There's all these ways for people to avoid your messaging. However, if you, you've noticed, People pass around, if somebody does a really creative video or a really creative ad or, or a meme, that gets passed around. So creativity is your way to get past the fact that we're bombarded with all these messages and we're trying to avoid them. Albert Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And in this context, I think that's very true because we all can learn how to use the tools that are available to us. We can all learn, you know, whatever the new Facebook algorithm tells us to do. There will be a bunch of articles on it. We can all figure it out. We can all figure out all these things. The knowledge is available. It's at our fingertips. It's in our pockets. But your imagination, being able to come up with something different, being able to come up with an idea that somebody else doesn't have, that's more important today than ever. Or if you'd like, your quotes from somebody from this century. Lady Gaga said, when you make music or write or create, it's really your job to have mind-blowing, irresponsible, condomless sex with whatever idea you're writing about at the time. And what she's really saying is, come up with an idea that you're passionate about, that you're not afraid to break the rules, that you're not afraid to be irresponsible about and not do what everybody else is doing, because that's what's going to stand out. Lady Gaga is not for everyone, but everyone knows who she is because she does things that stand out, that are different, that are creative. So I'm going to walk you through, if you think, well, I'm, I'm not a creative person, and I don't have the time to be agile, I'm going to give you four or five ideas on how you can be creative and how you can be agile. Starting out, one idea for being creative is look at things from the opposite point of view. What is everybody in your niche doing? What is the opposite of that? Um, so what do I mean by that? OK, the example I have, if you're a nonprofit or you're an organization trying to get money for a cause, they all do the same thing. They get pictures of the sad kids that need your help or the sad dogs that need your help. They got Sarah McLaughlin playing in the background. <laughs> everybody does that. So. Water is Life said, let's take the opposite approach. Let's take the people that need your help and have them sympathize with your first world problems. And 
this is what they did. Water is Life is a charity that deals with real, life-threatening problems. Ones that make ours at home seem trivial in comparison. To put this into perspective, we flipped the popular yet insensitive First World Problems meme on its head and used it to help spread awareness of the world water crisis. This is the hashtag killer. The first ever attempt to end a hashtag rather than promote it. I hit when my phone charger won't reach my bed. I hit when my little seats aren't heated. When I go to the bathroom and I forget my phone. Let me tell you the machine at the end. The phone is just not safe. To launch the project, we created an anthem commercial by gathering first world problem tweets and having people in Haiti recite them. But perhaps even more effective was the series of personalized responses in which various Haitians console those who have used the hashtag. I'm sorry you've been working by cleaning a lady. I'm sorry you let us I'm sorry you have to get up off the couch. I hope you're gonna get better. My name is Sandra. If I was, if I was there, I'd get better for you. The campaign was immediately picked up by celebrities, influencers, and every major news outlet. But it was bigger than just gaining impressions or ending hashtags. We were able to change the conversation through social media. Instead of complaining about first world problems, people began using the hashtag as a vehicle to spread Water is Life's message and to encourage donations. And enough donations came in to provide over a million days worth of clean water to those in need. Some people called it a meme jacking campaign. Others called it reverse trending. But we call it hashtag killer. Not just an attempt to end a hashtag, but to use social media to effect a real change in our world. So there you go. Take a look at your niche. Take a look at w what you're doing. What is everybody doing? If you did the exact opposite, what would it look like? And as you can see, by being creative and doing the act actual opposite, it was very successful for them. And being creative isn't just for the people who write and design and are, have creative in their title like me. You can be creative if you're a strategist. Um, this, if, you're, if you're the one who does the strategies, if you're the one who figures out how you go to market, you, you can be creative there too. And one way you can do that is look for new connections for your target audience. Now, is there a different way that the, that the people you're trying to buy your product or use your service, is there a different way you can connect with them? Let's say, for instance, your business relies on tourism, and the place that relies on tourism all of a sudden isn't in fashion anymore. Like, let's say, tourism to Mexico. And the current client here in, in the United States is that uh, the president keeps talking about how if you go down there, there's caravans of rapists and bad men. And, and so how do you get people to want to come, you know, find a different way to connect with people. Particularly, in their case, their largest target market is the people in the border states, where they're putting up the wall or not. We don't know. Um, and here's what they did. Mexico's first destination is America. But America's first destination is not Mexico. So, we went to a typical American town to ask why they don't consider Mexico an option to travel to. Would you consider going to Mexico? No way. The idea of going to Mexico is not something that I would foresee. That's not my cup of tea. Let me stay here in peace and let those folks stay on their side of the border. Do you like tequila? Yes. Do you like burritos? Yeah. Do you like Mexico? No. And when your company <laughs> name is El Mexico, well, so how do we increase USA flights to Mexico if a big part of Americans just don't like Mexico? According to the Department of Homeland Security, Mexican immigration goes as far as the 1800s settling in on the South, meaning that a big percentage of Mexican ascendants in the USA doesn't even know it yet. So we did a DNA test to prove it and turned
turn those results into discounts. The more Mexican they are, the more discount they get. Joshua, you are 18% Mexican. Oh, wow. So you get 18% off the flight of Mexico. Charlotte, you are 14.4% Mexican. You're 22% Mexican. That's bullshit. You are 18% Mexican. Well, that's better than you. <laughs> so you get 22% off the flight of Mexico. Oh, come on out. Seriously? Okay. That's real. So what if I want to take my wife? Eligible for a 15% discount to go to Mexico. <laughs> what do you think about that? I love discounts. I'm sorry, Betsy. You're only 3% Mexican. <laughs> So we kept getting discounts all over South America in our travel agencies. In our discounts, there are no borders within us. Yeah, I'd go to Mexico if they had Taco Bells on the street corner back in there. <laughs> so there you see, they had a problem. There, all these people down in the southern part of the country didn't want to go to Mexico. They found, they came up with a creative and innovative way to give them a discount, to get them involved in it. Where, so the guy went from, I don't want to go to Mexico, to, ha, I'm more Mexican than you are. <laughs> the other guy went from bullshit to, can I take my wife? <laughs> so just by coming up with a creative way to solve that solution, you know, what can we do to connect with this thing? Okay, we found some facts that, that Immigration in the South has been a part of it for over 100 years. Chances are a lot of people have some Mexican heritage in it. You know, doing the genealogy things become a thing. So just look at, look at your, your, the people you're trying to connect with and find a creative way to connect with them. Another way you can be creative, find ways to get unexpected business operations and departments into your campaign. You know, the connecting with your with your people and marketing your your client, your services, your product doesn't just have to involve the people in the marketing department or the people in management. Uh, we had we have a uh, furniture retailer down in Virginia that we work with, and when we took over running their Facebook for them, they had a problem in that they had hardly anybody was connected to it and there was hardly any engagement. And it's like, how can we get more people to, to like them on Facebook and start engaging with them? So we th we're thinking about when it comes to buying furniture, what's that moment of joy? It sure as hell isn't when you're working with the salesperson. Nobody likes that part of the thing. What's that moment of joy in your furniture buying experience? Well, it's when you get it in your home. It's when you see what it looks like in your home. And who are the people who, who bring in that furniture? It's our delivery guys. So we came up with a campaign where we involved this department you would have never thought of, including in your marketing, the, the delivery personnel. And what we did was we came up with, we created a sheet that we gave every one of the delivery people and we, we trained them. On one side, you know, it, uh, it said, show us your new furniture on Facebook for a chance to win a free gift. We didn't even say what the gift was because they wanted to change it every month. That's what the gift was. Some copy about that. And then on the other side, we showed them, you know, everybody likes to get positive feedbacks from their friends. So we showed an example of, hey, look, if you put your, your furniture online, you can get all these great comments from your friends on how great it is. So we trained the, the delivery guys when you deliver it, if they're really happy with the furniture, rip off one of these and give it to them. Obviously, if they're not happy, we don't want them on our Facebook. Don't <laughs> hand them one. But most of the time, they were happy. And it worked very well. We were able to get a ton, we, a ton more people liked. We had a lot of engagement. We, so we got posts like this, where this person posted the thing, says, got my new furniture today, super comfy. Thanks for all your help. Kelly, your patience with my indecision helped me settle on the perfect fabric. Now to accessorize the rest of the room. And we came back in. Looks great, Terry. 
Glad to hear you're enjoying your new furniture. Have fun accessorizing. So this person put up a thing, talked about how the salesperson helped them when they were indecisive, which we all know is a problem. People don't like salespeople. So it was a positive thing about the salespeople. <coughs> and of course, you know, she said she wanted to accessorize. We don't jump in and try and sell her accessories. We just tell her have fun doing it. She knows we have accessories. Another person posted, both the husband and the wife posted here. This is our new bonded leather sectional from Grands. The best thing about it, this furniture is it allows us to host family and friends at the house and provides a great comfort for us just for hanging around. Thank Grands, the name is Grand, but thank Grands Lynchburg, Virginia. You guys rock. And then the husband came in, love, love, love this couch. Grands made it easy to get what we wanted <coughs> and needed for our family. The guys that came to set it up were professional and awesome. So a shout out to our delivery guys. And then get, getting another group with another department involved, we let the salespeople know this was happening. The salesperson got on and said, thanks, Mike and Candy, for allowing me to work with you guys. Glad you enjoy it. So <clears throat> when you're thinking about marketing, and one other way you can be creative is think about what other departments within the organization you could get involved in and help them get your story out. Help, who, in, you know, and generally when you talk to these people and, and, they, and ask them to be a part of it, they get excited about it because no one's ever asked them to. You know, the delivery guys, no one's ever asked them, hey, we need you to be a part of this marketing campaign. We need you to, to do this. And they were excited to do it. So look at who you think you can, can do that with. Another way you can be creative is you can partner with another brand to create a surprise. You know, we, one of the things that, that gets us excited and makes something memorable is, is there's a surprise twist in it. And it, sometimes bringing in another brand and doing a co-branded thing can, can create that surprise that really sticks with someone. My favorite Super Bowl ad this last year did just that. Bud Light teamed up with Game of Thrones. And, it was totally unexpected. You, you have this whole Bud Light night thing that they've been doing forever. And he's like this in, invincible knight. And they have this joust. And he gets knocked off his horse. So they're, they're surprise number one. And you see the knight that, that knocked him off his horse. And if you're a Game of Thrones fan like I am, you recognize the helmet. It's like, that's the mountain. What the hell's going on here? And the next thing, there's dragons burning everything up. And, it's, <laughs> and it, it was it was. It created a surprise by combining the two brands in a way that I thought was very creative and very memorable. It's a beautiful day for a toast. Indeed. Sun's out. Got my lucky loincloth, cold Bud Light, comfy throne. I don't have the plague anymore. Look, it's the Bud Light. <laughs> All right, let's tap this chair. Obviously, they spent millions of dollars on that, and I'm guessing most of your clients don't have that kind of cash. <laughs> but that the concept of being creative by finding another brand to partner with and doing something surprising so it sticks in someone's mind, it, that works at any level. Another way you can be creative is to do something no one else is doing. Now, we talked earlier about doing the opposite of, of what people in your niche are doing. Well, think about what would you what would your brand, what would you think they would never do? And then can you do it? Now, where's some place you would never put your advertising? And where no one puts their advertising? In the case of an app called Eat24, they found there was, there was one place they could put ads where they could be creative with them 
and no one else was there, and that was to advertise on porn sites. <laughs> so they created these ads, and, and they found that, that not, only, not only were the ads a fraction of the cost of the ones they were putting on Facebook and, and Google, but they were three times as effective. And the people who got the app through, this, uh, through these ads were twice as likely to continue using it. It, it. In fact, it was so successful that they wrote a blog post on how to advertise on porn sites, which if you want to see it, that's where you go. And it actually started out as an influencer campaign because they were monitoring you know, who was tweeting about their, their product. And they noticed there was a number of porn stars who were tweeting about using their product. And if you think about it, if, you have, if you're a live cam model or whatever, you can't run out and get something to eat. So once they found these people and they knew they had a loyal following, they started providing, seeking them out and providing them free services if they would talk about it. And that started going well. So that's how they started looking to. And there was no competition. Because the only other ads on porn sites are for other porn sites or for sex toys. So this, something like this really stood out and turned out to be very effective. Now, I'm not saying you should get your clients or your <laughs> in, thing on, on a porn site. But think about, you know, make a list. Just sit down and make a list. What are the things we would never do? And then think about what would happen if we did it? So that, that's another way to be creative. So let's shift to agility. There's a ton of great quotes about creativity. Quotes about agility suck. This is the best one I could find. Agility means you are faster than your competition. Agile time frames are measured in weeks and months and not years. And we all know today they're actually measured in days and hours and not weeks. You know, the time frames keep moving up, especially if you're on social media or working in the digital media. People expect responses quickly. People expect you to, to get back to them. They expect things to be relevant rather quickly. So this is another way you can be agile. How many of you remember a few years ago when they had a, a power failure at the Super Bowl and they had to wait like 20, 30 minutes for the lights to come back up? How many of you remember this tweet? Oreo, because they had already put together a group, they had already been marketing it as an agile company that responds to what's going on. During that 20 to 30 minutes when nothing was going on because this, the network had already run all their things all day, uh, they had to wait for the lights to warm up. So they tweeted out, you can still power out, no problem. You can still dunk in the dark. Many people hailed that as the best Super Bowl ad that year, including me. I write a column in our blog about what I think are the best Super Bowl ads this year. But what made it one of the best Super Bowl ads that year wasn't that it was creative. Sure, it's kind of cute, but it's, it wasn't the creativity that made it great. It was the agility that made it great. It was the fact that they were able to, during that 20, 30 minute time, that everybody was sitting, thumbing through Twitter, finding things to do. They created this and they got it right out. And the reason they were able to do that is because they, they had made a commitment to create ads about whatever was going on on a regular basis. How does a product that hasn't changed a lick in 100 years find its way to the center of the cultural dialogue? It takes a lot of bravery and a little swagger. The strategy was to reimagine pop culture through the eyes of Oreo. We called it Daily Twist, an ambitious exercise in real-time culture jacket. 100 days, 100 twists. Oreo translated each piece of pop culture into shareable social content. Agency partners and brand stakeholders created a virtual newsroom, collaborating to create a new piece of content every single day. It was a risky move for our 100-year-old brand, but we believed in the power of real-time social content. See, it wasn't just about making stuff. It was about creating a platform for conversation. We made the content talkable. And 
people talked. And for the final twist, we handed it over to our fans to decide. Daily Twist became a living, breathing part of culture, just like Oreo has been for over a century. Some pretty important people noticed. From classic cookie to media darling, we've changed the way a new generation experiences Oreo, and we're just getting started. So, paying attention to what's going on, tying it, your brand, your service into something fairly quickly is another way to get attention from all those messages we're being bombarded with and trying to avoid. How many of you are familiar with, with David Meerman Scott's uh, newsjacking? Okay, he wrote the book. The concept is, it's kind of what Oreo did. It, the concept is take a news, something happening in the news, and create content relevant to it so it, your content becomes part of the news. His favorite example was there was, I forget exactly what it was, but it was a, a, some kind of tech security firm, and two of the top competitors of, of one of them were merging. And like typical big corporations, they were being very hush-hush about it. They weren't putting out any information about it. But their main competitor, the president of that company, saw that this was happening, sat down and wrote a long op-ed about what he thought it meant to the industry, this, this merger. So he, didn't, he wasn't talking about his specific brand. He was just talking about the overall industry and what was going to happen to this merger. Now, journalists, just like the rest of us, when they're looking for information, they just start Googling things. So when they Googled this, in, this merger, all they could find was a very small press release that the two companies merger, merging found had put out, and this op-ed by the president of their top competition. So almost every news story about that merger contained quotes about that merger's competition, from that merger's competition. So by creating content that was relevant, he was able to get his own company out there all the time. And, it, and when you create content that, that's relevant to, to, and news jack, it, does, it doesn't necessarily, it can live beyond the news cycle. Um, a few years ago, when they had a record snowstorm up in Canada, this chiropractor, Tim Wood, went outside and he, and he recorded a seven minute video on the proper way to shovel all this snow without hurting your back. It was relevant to his brand, but it was relevant to what was going on right then and there. And it got a lot of play. I'm not playing it for you because it's pretty boring seven minutes, but, and none of us want to look at snow anymore. But, <laughs> But you get the idea. He, he created this video. And then what happened was this last winter, there was another record s snowstorm. The largest news media hub found this video and posted it on their site. So he got a ton more of links back into his business because he had created this, this piece of content that tied into it. Of course, if you're going to news jack, you need to be careful. Um, some people do it horribly wrong, like Kenneth Cole. During the Arab Spring and the Egypt uprising, he thought a good way to news Jack would be say, millions in the uproar in Cairo. Rumor has it they heard about our spring collection now available online at, and then you can see about an hour later, I had to put, uh, regarding the Egypt, we, we weren't intending to make light of a serious situation. We understand the sensitivity of this historic moment. Obviously, he did not understand the sensitivity. So don't be a dick when you're, <laughs> when you're newsjacking. So that was a newsjack fail. Last year when David Bowie died, Crocs put out this one. I wouldn't call it a fail, but I'd call it a miss. Anybody tell me why this is not a good newsjack? Anyone? All the connection is Crocs. Exactly. They have no connection to David Bowie. 
I'm a huge David Bowie fan. I'm pretty certain he never wore Crocs. Uh, you know, so it's, they're, they're trying to tie into the news, but their brand has no connection to David Bowie. And, and even if they were, even let's say the, the president of the company was a huge Bowie fan and wanted to honor him, well then put a picture of David Bowie. Don't put a picture of your Crocs. You know, so newsjacking can be a very powerful way to get your word about your company out there. But it can also be, lead to just disaster if you're not doing it right. So be careful when you do it. Another way to be agile is to find ways to help thing, people. I mean, that's really when you look at how social media has worked, the companies doing right are, are finding ways to help people. Um, you know, you should always be look, reading your posts and your comments and your emails, and when people are looking for some help, you give them help. You, you get right in there and you answer their questions. Um, there, another way, this was a suggestion I had for a local pizza franchise. Say so you just monitor in the area around your, around your franchise and you happen to see a tweet from someone that says, I ordered a pizza an hour ago from Papa John's. Can't believe it's still not here. Well, if you're being agile, you could send that person a tweet and say, hey, we're, uh, we're Mike's Pizza down the street. Sorry you're going hungry. We'd like to help you out. Uh, DM us your address. We'll get you a pizza within 10 minutes for free. You know, so if, if you help someone out and, and did that, you'd, you'd be able to, uh, you know, you'd get a lot of word of mouth. That person's going to tell a lot of people that that happened. Um, on a larger scale, Red Cross did this when there was the disaster in Haiti. They came up with this idea that had never been done before. Hey, if you, if you just text this number, $10 will be added to your bill. It was a way that they saw a problem, wanted to help, was able to create a response really quickly. It, it brought in millions of dollars within days. And it has now become a standard way to help in these kinds of crises. Another way to, is to be agile is to respond to customers, to competition, to changing market conditions. When you see something going on, jump in and respond to it quickly. Uh, a couple years ago, one of H&R Block's competitors ran a bunch of ads that didn't name H&R Block, but they were obviously targeting them, talking about how you know, the guy who was the plumber under the sink was also their tax person, how they're not full-time tax people. And H&R Block immediately came up with a response, sent out a message to all of their tax people all across the country and got hundreds of them to write a quick thing about who they were and post the pictures online. It was something that didn't cost a lot of money. They just went out and did it. So. One gal's hold up, I, I served 450 taxpayers in 2012. I found 80 people more money with second look. I assisted over 30 victims of income tax fraud, ID theft. I am a resource in my community. I am a, an H&R Block tax pro. And they, went, they had a ton of the different people do it. They are even their marketing people and, and Henry R. Block himself they all just wrote up little signs, held them up, took a picture, posted them on, online. It was a way to respond very quickly to something that happened. Another way to be responsive is you can use the data and algorithms. You know, now we've got so much data available to us, so many algorithms that you can create, uh, you can automate something that that so you are responding to, to things very agilely in terms of giving them creative that goes exactly to them. Uh, Campbell Soup in Australia did just that, creating a whole bunch of different ads relating to whatever you were searching for. The soup has been nourishing humanity for millennia. Yeah. That's why Campbell's believes, no matter what life throws at you, we better soup for that. The trouble is, we only ever think to cook it when it gets cold. And with 2016 marking Australia's warmest winter on record, sales of Campbell's soup had hit an all-time low. 
We needed to make a 20,000 year old dish relevant in 2016. So we created SoupTube, a pre-roll campaign with over 1,700 individual ads. Each one specifically tailored to the video you were searching for on YouTube. Excited for the new season of Orange is the New Black? You'll be served this. If you're listening to single ladies, you'll see this. Trying to make sense of world politics? Can't let go of let it go? Looking for fail videos? Searching for carpool karaoke? Catching up on UFC highlights? Need cooking advice? New Star Wars trailer? We even created daily pre-rolls related to the world's trending topics like Brexit, the Icelandic soccer team and Pokemon Go. It allows us to be really relevant, really topical and really quick. And I think it's a really interesting campaign just because of how targeted it is and it really sets a benchmark for how brands and their agencies should consider communications moving forward. This resulted in an average view rate of 90%, a total of 2.5 million impressions, a 24.7% lift in ad recall and a 6.9% lift in brand awareness. And best of all, a 55.6% increase in sales of Campbell's Simply Soups. We didn't give Australians a reason to buy Campbell's Soup, we gave them thousands, helping Campbell's Soup become relevant almost 20,000 years later. I'm gonna go get some soup. So there are tools out there that you can use. You don't need to create 1,700 ads, but you know, Maybe you create five and, and market them to different people based on who they are and what they're looking for. And of course, be agile enough to switch gears when something isn't working or conditions change. I don't have an example for this, but it's just, a, as you put your plans forth, don't doggedly stick to them if they're not working, if something, or if the conditions, the market conditions change. Be agile to be quick and be able to change what's going on. And of course, if you're able to combine both agility and creativity, you've got a winner. And someone who's done that very well recently is BarkBox, whose their site is full of a bunch of memes that tie into what's going on. So you see a fashion model with these weird holes in her dress. Hey, we've got a chew toy that kind of matches it, so we'll do a meme on who wore it best. Or when... Uh, That's from Mean Girls. That's no fashion. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, when Bird Box became a, a trending thing and everybody was doing the Bird Box challenge, well, you know, we're practically the same name. We'll just cross off ARK and put IRD, blindfold a couple of dogs, and there's a meme. So there's using creativity and agility together. That's my spiel. <laughs>